far up in the sky, flying V-shaped as the wild goose. The curlew leads the way in April. With his keen eyes surveying from the heavens the glories of the world, he sweeps over the wild beauty of the tropics, calling now and then his silver trumpet note of command to his flock. But when he looks down from the clouds and sees the thousand rivers, creeks, channels, and solemn marshes of old Tidewater, Virginia, his voice rings with joy and the whole flock break their long silence with such a shout as the Greeks of old raised when, homeward bound, they first beheld the sea. Thomas Dixon, Jr., 1895. Most of the hunting lodges, a lot of it was after the Civil War. And the land was cheap, and it was a gilded age in America. There was a lot of money to be spent, and they wanted to entertain. Fallon Point was built in the early 1900s by the Regal Manufacturing Company, which was a cotton glove company. My grandfather was lucky enough to become the caretaker of Fallon Point. And he was given a steady salary and a beautiful place to live. My grandfather lived in a cottage next to the clubhouse you see now. And that's where he raised his family. He had two children, my father and my aunt. And they lived there until they were teenagers, until the 1933 storm brought them ashore. And it was my understanding that a lot of the cousins would go out there and stay for the week. And there's a lot of entertainment out there. Where he got a steady paycheck during the Depression, he had a little bit more resources than some of the other people up on the mainland to, to take care of different people. I guess his groceries were all paid for by the corporation. Of course, they had lights out there, electric lights, but they had a generator system, Delco generator system. They had running water. And they had fine china, silverware, and all the proper linens for the beds. It was a, it was a nice place. Here's a picture of my grandfather and grandmother standing on the dock at Fallon Point. And of course, she's in a, it's like a white dress with white shoes on and high heels and how she how she did that, I don't know. Somehow she had to get to that dock in some marshy area. And my, my father was born in 1921, so he's still in my grandmother's arms at maybe four or five years old. So this is 26, 20, 1926, 27, I guess. And this shows how they're eating uh, dinner. And you can, uh, that would been my grandfather and grandmother and aunt. And, and of course, the rest of them are guests that would have come down. and. You can see how the table is set with the fine china. So they were doing real well out there on that marsh. This was the dining room table that they used. And of course, you can see how well it's made and how sturdy it was made to be in a clubhouse. The, the story I like best was by, by the button my grandfather had underneath the table where he could ring into the kitchen and the cooks would bring the course of meals in. and, and uh, he wouldn't have to get up from the table or interrupt his conversation.
New Orleans uh, being away from the mainland, you know, you could go out there and you, know, you can still today go out there and get lost. Sandbars, inlets, creeks, marshes, tidal flats. The islands tug at me because of so many people that, in my family that were out there. My great-great-grandfather, when he was done working for the Life Saving Service on Hog Island, began working at the Elkins Gun Club outside of Worcester for uh, Mr. Elkins of West Virginia. His son-in-law, Cecil Lewis, which would have been my great-grandfather, was a hunting guide for the Elkins Gun Club. My family basically lived off the water. You know, hunted for their food, and here they're offered a roof over their head and food in their stomach for something they were doing anyway. And it, it was like a win-win situation for them. It was a place for the people who had money for them to get away, have fun, whether it was waterfowl, in the winter, in the spring, you had shorebirds, and of course, you know, filling in between. They fished at the lodge. I mean, it was always something going on at the lodge year round. The lodge was kept up. This is Elkins Gun Club. Probably 50 feet on either side of this chimney was a single story structure. Beautiful structure here in the middle of the marsh, in the middle of nowhere. You can still see the poles that it was sitting on. The 33 storm did the damage that we see today. It's a, been a structure added to the top of the chimney. It's a box for peregrine falcons. And when we first got here this morning, you, you know, they weren't here, but they, they, were soon, they soon came back to let us know that this was their area now and not ours. You know, we may have borrowed this land for a little while for, for our use, but nature's taking it back. The Cobbs Island Hotel was built on basically a sand spit. Luckily for Nathan Cobb, right after he bought the land, it started accreting, it started building up. And by the time he had his hotel there, there were trees and uplands that had gardens and that kind of thing. Nathan Cobb moved down here from Massachusetts in October of 1837. As soon as he moved down here, he saw this island offshore sand shoal and for $150 bought it and moved out there and within three months applied for an ordinary license to serve beer and food to boarders that might come by there. They family salvaged the shipwreck that they used the funds from that to build the hotel. They were sort of really rough hewn watermen, wreckers, commercial hunters servicing and dealing with these wealthy people from Richmond and Baltimore and New York and all over the place. They really related to him. There was no conventionality at Cobbs, no grades of social position. Everyone was on an equal footing. The proprietors would saunter through the room clad in their usual costumes of an oilcloth hat, Guernsey jacket, canvas breeches, and rubber boots reaching to the hip. But withal, there were no bonny faces in America that were as popular, for the Cobbs were so sincere, so true, so democratic that they treated all alike. 
Whether you were noble or serf, rich or poor, famous or unknown, it was all the same to them. And when the visitors left the island, it was with regret at the parting. Alexander Hunter, 1895. The real game changer came in 1884 when the railroad came through. Prior to that, in order to get to Cobbs Island, you had to take a steamer from Baltimore to Norfolk, then take another boat from Norfolk to Cherrystone Landing, take a wagon across the peninsula to the seaside, and then yet another boat from the landing there over to Cobb Island. So it was quite a journey to go to Cobbs Island. When the railroad came through in 1884, it totally changed that. Then suddenly, you could get on the train in Philadelphia in, in the early morning, and you could have dinner on Cobbs Island that evening. We were within a day's train ride of the major urban centers in the Northeast, New York, Philadelphia, Richmond, Washington, and a lot of the wealthy people there came down here to recreate. The hunting clubs came not just to the Eastern Shore, but to the entire Atlantic coast. I mean, they were all up and down the Back Bay area of Virginia Beach, the Outer Banks. There were just hundreds, literally, of, of clubs. It was easy to get here with the railroad, easy to access the resources here. And we had a lot of them. Large concentrations of wildfowl and waterfowl and oysters and fish. That really gave rise to a lot of these private clubs. These were syndicates that a group of businessmen got together, formed for their own use. This one on Hog Island called Broadwater Club, which was, I think, mainly people from Philadelphia. Wallops Hotel was uh, mainly people from Philadelphia and I think maybe also a few from Washington, D.C. Accomac Club in the marshes behind Paramore Island were mainly folks from New York. The Mears family had a clubhouse called the Island House on Cedar Island where they entertained people who would go surf bathing or hunting and fishing. On Mockhorn Island, a fellow named Cushman uh, from New York built a big clubhouse. Even in the 1800s, it was about the experience. The people coming from the cities, they'd be coming to not just shoot birds, but to experience the food, the people, the culture, the atmosphere. Um, and certainly they were there to hunt too, but it was a whole package is what they were interested in. It gave them a view into a whole different lifestyle and a whole different way of life. President Cleveland came down and spent quite a bit of time at the Broadwater Club on Hog Island. And of course, when he came, his visits were documented in all the daily newspapers across the country. These were high society people. It took a lot of money to, in order to come down here, build a clubhouse and furnish it and hire local people to run it and all and keep it going on an annual basis. The Akenbach Club, for example, they have a photograph of the dining room and there are gun racks on both sides of the dining room, a very fancy dining room table, uh, fancy dining room chairs, all these plants. There's a, a kind of a bow window in the background. So it was not roughing it at all, it was just the opposite. They were uh, servants taking care of them and they had cooks to provide for them and guys to take them out. That's the lifestyle those people lived in New York and Baltimore. They just brought it down with them. These people were pretty high society, you know, dealing with a bunch of local watermen and farmers here on the Eastern Shore. My grandfather, uh, Jimmy Chornick, worked as a uh, caretaker for the Cushmans. Uh, it was the Cushmans that owned it when he worked for them. Uh, they were bakers from New York. Evidently, just about every corner in New York at one time had a Cushman's Bakery on it, and it was very, very uh, successful. He and his wife bought Mockhorn Island, and they basically added on to that. They had their main house uh, that was uh, built attached to the cottage that was originally there. They had a greenhouse. They had a hot house. You had a smokehouse added barns, stables, a seawall that even by today's standards, if it was built, it would be considered a nice seawall. I mean, they basically had a manicured lawn, prettier than you know, some of the lawns we see today in people's yards. I mean, and this was you know, on an isolated island.
you know, Mockhorn Island was bought by the Cushman family. Very, very successful. And he retired down here. He would tell people, I've made so much money I can never spend it all. You can see the remnants of his sea walls. You can see how much he did, how much he spent. You know, trying to fight the ocean. Well, you know what? When he died, he was just about broke. That island broke him. waste anything. Inside these walls they packed in uh, eelgrass for insulation and uh, I mean you're talking well over 150 years ago and that eelgrass is still in here packed in just as tight like a brick. It's a native species of uh, aquatic grass. That's the favorite food of a brant and uh, brant was one of the big things they hunted back then. It was a foundation species that supported a lot of the wildfowl. And when it disappeared because of a blight in 1933, right along concurrent with the hurricane, we lost uh, all of our sea ducks that we used to have in the coastal bays, all the scalp and redheads and canvasbacks. The brant population crashed up and down the whole Atlantic and almost disappeared. So there was a big change in the wildfowl population because of that grass disappearing. Lodge itself from where we're standing is, uh, you can make out the roof and the back chimney, the main chimney right over here. Nothing's going to be permanent out there. Uh, sea wall and impoundment that they've got right in the back here. You know, engineers like to think they can control nature, but in the long run, it's going to go underwater or move or change. beach moves so you can't build anything on it and expect it to be there permanently it's just doesn't happen about midnight the different inmates of the cottage were aroused one by one with the startling information that the tide was rising and bursting over its high water mark and was advancing in angry charges that would sweep the island away they all ran for safety to the hotel, which occupied the highest point of ground on the island. The angry roar of the waves was now heard, mingled with the scream of the blast, and surely and slowly, the black billows advanced. The bathhouses were swept away. Next, the Coast Guard's house was torn from its place and drifted inland. The crowd assembled in the ballroom of the hotel, the women cried and moaned. The men cursed and prayed alternately. They could do nothing. They shrank appalled as the treacherous waves closed in around them. Like caged rats, they could only wait and hope for the coming day and the subsidence of the waters. Alexander Hunter, 1895. When Nathan Cobb built the hotel, it was like 500 yards from the ocean. And by the early 1890s, it was a couple hundred feet from the ocean. Uh, hurricane in uh, 1896 the, uh, pretty much washed the, the hotel down, and one in October of 1897 literally wiped the island clean. Nathan Cobb saw all this going on and sold out to a uh, syndicate of people from Lynchburg, Virginia, before he lost everything. When Nathan Cobb they were auctioning off the contents of the Cobb Island Hotel and there at the harbor after the storm in the 1890s. And he came in the harbor and 
uh, a newspaper reporter asked him if he had any comment, and he said, yeah, you can't fight the ocean. All of these on Rebels Island were taken in 1913. 1913. Every, every one of them were dated. Wow. But if you'll notice, here are some Rebels Island people visiting Broadwater. Broadwater, Hog Island, yeah. And, uh, the clubs are really a special place ingrained in the hearts of most Eastern Shore people. I was born and raised on the Eastern Shore and lived all my life here. When I was about 10 or 11, one of the guides in Wachaprig came down to the dock where I was with my dad and had a picture of the Accomack Club. And I just flipped. I couldn't believe that a building such as that could stand out on that marsh. Well, the interesting part about the Rebels Island Club is, is it's more of a social club. You see women. Accomack Club, you never saw women. Broadwater, you never saw women. It was all men. As a young person, I worked on the charter boats, fishing out of Watch Brig. And when we went down to the south end, we would go through the Swash Channel, and you would pass where the uh, Rebels Island Club was. I do find this one somewhat amusing. This is the boathouse, and on the back it says, this is where the men go to open a keg now and then. <laughs> These people, for the most part, were people of means big business people, politicians, politicians yeah. and the saying was up and down the coast that the whole country was run from a duck blind. Duck blind yeah. And then sadly the depression and storms of the 30s brought it all to an end. Yep, you sure did. They were definitely a magic place in their day. They were happy times, but it's not to be. Nature's telling us that. The islands just won't stand it. Sometimes you, you have moments where you, you don't want to live here and you go somewhere else like Charleston and see fancy things and you kind of wish you had grown up down there. But then, you know, you look down at the oysters in the boat, and you look at your dog beside you. Sometimes when you're coming in the creek, you go, wow. My father came in this creek, my grandfather came in this creek, and probably two or three more before him, and you're kind of like doing the same thing they were doing. Here. Of course, this was all one open room with the center fireplace, but this was the dining room, and the dining room table that I have in my house today would have been in this direction right here with the china cabinet and the sideboard. I was always amazed as a child how big the fireplaces were, and at the time we still had some logs in there that were very long. and. I know my grand, my father probably wasn't entertained by him because he was the one bringing him up here. My dad would have been a child at the time. He would talk about when the guests came down, how he would always be putting the wood in the fireplace and how the place would smell of, of uh, wet wool and linseed oil and bourbon and cigars. This would have been the living room. And I remember a, uh, a full length sofa being here and it was uh, extremely close to the fireplace. There's a baby buzzard in here now that I don't really want to get any closer to because he doesn't seem to be real happy with me coming into his home. And up here we have the guest quarters. Of course, every, every room was identical. And every, every room had a view of the Hog Island Bay. But I did find myself 
picking up old boards and tossing them out the door and kind of want to come back and sweep the floors again and kind of, if she's going to go out, give her, let her go out in a little bit of style. One thing I do remember about Daddy was how content he was living here. How happy he was out there. He would go to work every morning singing and come back in singing. Looking back at it, he was, uh, I mean, he wasn't a wealthy man at all, but inside he was probably very rich because he was very content with where he was and what he did for a living. It was just a, a gradual tapering off as places would, would uh, you know, be washed away or destroyed, mostly by the ocean or by uh, occasionally by fire or something else, and sometimes, you know, economics. The Great Depression came through, and, and a lot of these wealthy people, industrials from up north, really suffered during that period and could no longer afford to uh, pay the fairly steep dues to be a member of a club. The folks would didn't have the money to maintain the things because it's very, very expensive maintaining a hunt club, especially on a barrier island. There was the Hurricane of 33, which was the highest high tides ever recorded here. It's the benchmark storm that all the other storms are compared to, uh, against. It sort of stimulated an exodus from all the islands. This is the last hunt club on the Barrier Island system of Virginia. One by one, all the structures on the Barrier Islands have washed away. And so I believe that ours is probably the last building standing. But it's just a fact of geology that this one's gonna wash away too. We have lost one mile of land since we started coming out here. So now when you look out these doors, you'll see the beach is right here in front of us. We step out onto sand. We used to walk a long trek through the marsh and through the woods and through 40-foot sand dunes and maritime forests to get to the ocean. And now it's right here. We're solidly built. We've been through many hurricanes since 1933. The government really built this place as solid as they could as a work project during the Depression, and the engineering of the place is just fascinating to look at the way they, they built it as strong as they did. To come out on a boat on an island is something that just can't be replaced. I think I was probably about seven years old and it was just great excitement when we first came out here. I remember coming with another dad and his sons. Uh, we did not know what to expect when we came here. This is this great big building on an island and everything was new to us. This place was an old decommissioned Coast Guard station that had been run as a hotel for several years after the Coast Guard decommissioned it and it came on the market for sale. So back around 1965, 1966, my father and a lot of his friends, they got 12 people together to buy this club together. We were all in our mid to late 30s when we bought this place. 
It's incredible to be able to run up and down a beach like that in a Jeep or just on your bare feet and have the whole damn five or six miles to yourself. To come out here on Friday night with about 10 or 15 boys ranging from six years old to 15 years old and the men out here cooking their big dinners and playing poker and having a great old time. And it created a, a community of family. You learned the hard way about tides and wind and weather and you got up early in the morning and it was cold and you're a little kid in boots that didn't fit and went out to hunt ducks with your dad. Our children have totally enjoyed it and their children totally enjoyed it. But it's, it's been a great uh, experience for us. And now with my family, with my own children, to be out here keeping it going and seeing my children have a great time for the first time being on an island. So to watch the next generation do all that is a great reward. Being out on a barrier island during a storm is one of the most thrilling things you can do. Because once the storm comes up, you can't leave. Your decision to stay is a permanent decision. And the tide starts coming up, the marsh goes underwater, and there's no land to be seen. You're like on Noah's Ark. Having been out here with my young family when a hurricane came through, that was, um, that was kind of scary because of the responsibility. And once we made the decision to stay, you hope you make the right decision. And then when you can't change your mind, you figure now what are we gonna do? So the children wake up the next day with their life preservers outside their bedroom door and we have the radios upstairs and everything. But um, then we just, we just did it and, um, and made it through. Used to be we could come and go at any tide, any time of the day, we had plenty of water. As the island has washed back and the ocean's gotten closer, it's filling in the marsh. Now we have to time every trip by the tides. We can't come and go at certain times, so access is an issue. And another big storm filling our creeks with sand could make it so that we can't have access anymore. We can't dredge out here. Eventually, the highest will fall down. I guess at some point, it'll be a chimney there, like you see on all these other marshes, and that'll be the, you know, that'll be the way that is. But I guess it just has to happen, and you, you kind of look at it, and you, you try not to think about it, and you, you come on home. Nobody lives on the Barrier Islands anymore. There are no hunt clubs out there anymore. There are no rich people coming down from New York to build these beautiful clubs out there. It's all gone, and all that we have left are the few photographs and the memories and the written accounts that people made when they did visit these places. One of the strange things about humans is we think we can do anything but you can't fight the ocean. It'll win in the end. It always has.